proceed to get started with today's meeting. Today is Tuesday, October 20th, and I'd like to call uh, this meeting of the Tennessee Board of Accountancy to order. This regularly scheduled meeting is taking place via WebEx, and the link to attend the meeting is available on the board's website. Additionally, the meeting date, time, and location have been properly noticed, and copies of the agenda were also posted to the Board of Accountancy website on October 13th, 2020. Uh, to begin, uh, Karen, I'll ask you to go ahead and perform a, an initial roll call, and, and we'll confirm a quorum. Sir, Andy Bonner. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Right. Here. I'm sorry, I turned okay. myself on mute. I apologize. Janet Booker Davis. Here. Pamela Church. Here. Stephen Eldridge. Here. Harry Elmore. Here. Greg Gilbert. Here. John Griesbeck. Here. Monroe. Here. Gay Moon. Here. Todd Skelton. I don't see Todd in the list. Uh, Todd has messaged Wendy that he is attending uh, the Governor's Unified Command meetings this morning and will be joining us a little bit late. Thank you. And Judy Weatherby. Here. Okay, thank you. Uh, appreciate that, Karen. Um, uh, the next item uh, it will be the reading of the statement of necessity uh, uh, for this meeting. And for that, I'll turn it over to uh, Maria. Thank you, Kevin. Um, good morning, board members. This is a regularly scheduled meeting for the Tennessee State Board of Accountancy, which is taking place via teleconference. Notice of this meeting was posted to the board's website on October 13, 2020. As there is not a physical quorum present, a statement of necessity is read into the record and filed with the Tennessee Secretary of State as required by statute. Pursuant to TCA 844-108-B2, if a physical quorum is not present at the location of a meeting of a governing body, and in order for a quorum of members to participate by electronic or other means of communication, the governing body must make a determination that a necessity exists. That determination must include a recitation of the facts and circumstances on which it was based. Further, TCA 844-108-A3 defines necessity as matters to be considered by the governing body at that meeting require timely action by the body. The physical presence by a quorum of the members is not practical within the period of time requiring action and that participation by a quorum of the members by electronic or other means of communications is necessary. As stated, this is a regularly scheduled meeting for the Tennessee State Board of Accountancy. The purpose of this meeting with members attending by teleconference is to conduct a quarterly scheduled meeting of the board via teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic. All voting will be conducted by roll call. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Maria. And also appreciate very much uh, uh, being allowed to meet uh, thanks to the governor's executive order and related extensions so that we can meet safely uh, during this time. Um, with respect to announcements, uh, introductions, just again would like to welcome John. I think this is your first formal board meeting uh, with us. John Griesbeck is joining us uh, and he represents uh, one of three members representing the Western Grand Division of the state that was appointed uh, over the summer to the board by uh, Governor Lee. And so John, again, welcome. To you. Um, from a housekeeping perspective, um, given that we are meeting via WebEx um, and we have to kind of deal with the technology, uh, we found that meeting uh, runs a little more smoothly if everyone will mute their microphone unless they are speaking. Um, that kind of reduces uh, by quite a bit the feedback uh, that we can get. So appreciate that. If there are questions, uh, you may use the chat function, but please use the chat everyone function so that I can see that and then I can uh, uh, attempt to call upon the, the person who has a question or a comment. Also, uh, Dustin will be our, our moderator for the WebEx meeting and can help troubleshoot if anyone has any technological uh, issues here. Uh, also, uh, this meeting is open to the public. It has been properly noticed. It will also be available for replay uh, in the next uh, day or two. 
uh, for those that would like to go back and replay all our portions of the meeting. I'd also like to welcome any members of the public uh, that are uh, dialing in or participating in this uh, WebEx uh, meeting. Uh, we hope that uh, the information that we will discuss will be um, uh, constructive and also uh, hope that um, uh, from this perspective, it, it will be you know another yet another avenue of inviting public uh, uh, viewings of, of our work in action. Um, as Maria indicated, due to the electronic nature of this meeting, all roll call votes, all votes will be conducted via roll call vote. So with that, um, we will go ahead and proceed. I think our first order of business is to review and adopt the agenda for today's meeting. So this agenda has been properly public noticed. Um, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So move. We have a second. motion, thank you. And is there a second with respect to I'll that second. motion? Second. Also have a second, thank you, Stephen. Um, any further discussion with respect to the agenda? If not, uh, Karen, will you please call the roll on that motion? Andy Bonner. Aye. Janet Booker Davis. Aye. Pamela Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Larry Elmore. Aye. Greg Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. Kevin Monroe. Aye. Amy Moon. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. Okay. Thank you, Karen. That motion passes. Uh, the next action item for the board is the approval of the minutes from the July 28th, 2000 get our meeting. Those minutes were previously provided. Um, is there a motion with respect to approval of the minutes for that meeting? I'll move. Thank I you. second. Thank you. Now we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion uh, or comment with respect to the minutes? Hearing none, Karen, will you please call the roll on that motion to approve the minutes from the July 28, 2020 board meeting? Yes, sir. Andy Bonner. Aye. Janet Booker Davis. Aye. Pamela Church. Aye. Eldridge. Aye. Gray Elmore. Aye. Greg Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. Kevin Monroe. Aye. A Moon. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. Okay, thank you. That motion passes. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the executive director's report. And for that, I'll turn it over to our executive director, Ms. Wendy Garvin. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning, everybody. Um, I have previously provided the executive director's report to the board members for review, so I'll walk through the items there and feel free to ask me any questions along the way. The first item on the report are future meeting dates. The first four dates listed there have already been approved by the board. So at the end of the report, we'll ask for um, a motion to approve the last date there, which is Tuesday, January 25th, 2022. Um, the next item here is just a reminder, which just came up uh, yesterday in committee meetings of the NASBA annual meeting, which is being conducted November 1st through the 4th, and that is a virtual meeting. It is no cost to the board members to attend. It does look like the registration deadline was yesterday, so hopefully you all were able to hop on and register for that. Um, if not, um, hopefully they will extend that for a few days. Yeah, I, Wendy, just to say that they, you can go ahead today and register without any problem. Okay. Okay, good. I kind of thought it was odd that the deadline was so early given the fact that it was virtual, but um, we will try to comply. Um, the next section is about the CPA exam. So testing is in, in India is in full swing. Um, we've seen an, an uptick in individuals from India. Uh, 
wanting to test there. Uh, we do. We are one of a few handful of states that doesn't have a residency requirement, so we see more international candidates than other states do. Um, one of the issues that has come about recently is um, an international uh, education evaluator by the name of WES is currently, um, they are designating a competency, a three-year competency-based education there as equal to a bachelor's degree in the U.S. And um, that is not consistent with several other international evaluators. And so once that report gets to NASBA, they are not able to accept that. And so we are just trying to gather some more information on that. We've updated some wording on the website to just make it clear to candidates that ultimately we are the ones that determine whether they meet the requirements to sit for the exam um, in Tennessee. So something we may come back to the board with if we get more information and need you all to make any decisions there. The NASBA International Evaluation Services, NASBA has their own international evaluation group. And we have worked with them over the past several months to also evaluate domestic education for individuals who may attend a college or university that's not accredited that doesn't meet our accreditation requirements. And this just gives those individuals an opportunity to have some of that education accepted by going through um, a deeper dive evaluation. So that's good news, and we've been able to help a candidate or two with that uh, process. Remote testing webinar, you all should have received um, some information on a remote testing webinar that they actually held one yesterday afternoon while we were in committee. Um, but there's also one on Thursday, and I highly encourage the board members, this is specifically for you, to see what a remote proctor um, process looks like with Prometric. And you as board members are going to be asked to decide whether you would be accepting of uh, remote testing going forward. So this is going to be a really good event for you to see uh, up close how this would work. Um, and I do not know yet whether it's going to be uh, recorded. My guess is yes, but we have not been told one way or the other. Exam results, um, as, as typically, I provide the uh, exam results for the prior quarter. Those are attached to my report. Um, AICPA Professional Ethics uh, Committee. Um, we've talked about this briefly before, but um, PEAK voted to expose uh, a revised proposal on staff, staff augmentation arrangements in August. The comment per period for this ends December 8th, and, and I provided a link where you could provide individual feedback. I have not gotten a sense from prior meetings that this board was interested in making a, um, any comments um, as a board, but you're welcome to go and share your individual thoughts there if you would like. I also provided a link to a Journal of Accountancy article published on the topic to give you some more information. The reason that I bring this up is because if there are changes to the code of conduct, that affects us, obviously, and licensees in the state um, because we have we do have a section of rules on code of conduct, but they are pretty limited. And once you get into more specific things, we refer to the code and the licensees need to do that as well. Uh, CPE and COVID, we have had a few inquiries about individuals concerned about the 1231 CPE reporting deadline. Um, I've kept in touch with other jurisdictions and we allow all uh, continuing education to be received via online or self-study. So um, none of the states that have a 1231 reporting period that allow all of their CPE to be um, earned online or have made any adjustments. So, um, and again, the inquiries we have, have received have been minimal. Um, I have reached out to TSCPA. Um, they have not heard to any um, concerns with the deadline. They've also seen a decent uh, amount of registrations for their virtual offerings. So if anyone has concerns about the CPE deadline, um, you can certainly bring those up and we can discuss those. But as of now, uh, I think the recommendation is to stick with the deadline and stick with the number of hours that are required. 
state-specific ethics. Um, I mentioned this at the last meeting where we had updated our website with some better information on how to get to the an approved ethics course. We also sent an email out to licensees on October 2nd, uh, reminding them of that requirement. As we noted yesterday in the CPE audit results, it was the one benchmark that was most missed was that state ethics course. So. Um, newsletter, we are working on a fall newsletter and it was, should be distributed in the next month and um, prior newsletters are available on our website. Educators Roundtable, uh, we talked about this at the last meeting and we ended up in cooperation with TSCPA, we were able to quickly get together, together an Educators Roundtable, which we uh, co-hosted with TSCPA on August 28th and we brought together educators from around the state and talked about the CP, CPA evolution project and the recent, re, recently released uh, C, CPE, I'm sorry, education model rules um, that are being exposed um, to change up the educational requirements to make it more flexible um, and meet the objectives of the CP, CPA Evolution Project. And Pam did attend that Educators Roundtable with us, so I thought it went really well. Do you have any thoughts, Pam, on that? No, I thought it was it was very useful. Um, was that recorded, Wendy? I mean, there weren't. I wish there had been more schools represented. That was my only regret. But um, it was it was really clearly presented, and questions were asked. I thought it was very useful. Uh, Kara, I do believe it was recorded. Correct. Yes, it was recorded, and I actually had a few educators reach out to me subsequent to the event, and I was able to share the link to them so that they could go back and watch it and and we can continue to do that if anyone um, I mean maybe wants a, to see it. maybe it's too much work but um, I think a lot of times those communications don't get disseminated among all professors that may just go to a key person in each school and it would be great at some point to make sure there's an email to all the professors with that link perhaps I don't know that's a suggestion but um, Sometimes professors, you know, uh, act as if things come as a surprise. And this is so far down the road. Um, you know, there's lots of opportunity to get input and also to disseminate information. So anyway, that was that was my only concern was that lots of people hear this. Yeah. Thank you, Pam. Um. We also talked about doing maybe a follow up to that as we get further down the road and things are adopted and, and we see next steps. So doing the same thing with that group um, down the road. NASBA Compliance Assurance Committee, um, I attended the, I serve on this committee for NASBA and I attended a CAC meeting on September 14th as a committee member. Um, we received an update on activities of the peer review board, some of the similar information you all heard from TSCPA yesterday. Um, other initiatives of the group are uh, putting together resources for procs across the country and now that several groups are doing regional procs since they are consolidating the administration of peer review. So working to help those states that are trying to pull together an effective prop that isn't overly burdensome to the administering entities. Um, so some, some good work going on there. Uh, performance metrics, these are the numbers that we are, uh, metrics that we are focused on here at the department and it's related to how quickly we can license an individual and how quickly we can resolve complaints uh, once they come into the building. And so I'm happy to report that uh, we are on average able to license somebody in around one and a half days, um, given that they provide everything that they need. And um, case and complaint that we are 100% on that goal of resolving cases within 180 days of, of being received. Um, online adoption rate, that's how many people apply for a license online versus sending paper in. So the past few months we have been at 100% on that as well. And of course, that's just uh, more efficient from the department standpoint, it's more efficient for the licensee um, to, to do everything online. Uh, and the last part of the report are new licenses issued. 
Um, we did see, obviously, with COVID in quarter two and the testing centers down for a bit there, we did see a decline. But numbers look like they are coming back. Quarter three, we issued 179 licenses, which is comparable to the prior year in quarter three. And we did see an uptick in firm permits. Uh, maybe people have lost their positions and they're opening up their own firms. Um, hard to tell where that increase may be coming from, but we are ahead of last year for the entire year. Um, so we've, we've issued 64 firm permits so far this year. And the last section there are your total over, overall licensing population for individual licenses. And then the last page has your uh, firm permits active um, and the various um, statuses of licenses. And so that concludes my report. If you have any other questions, happy to take those. Wendy, I have a question on the statistics that you provided on the exam performance. Mm -hmm. um, in looking at the, not only Tennessee, but also <clears throat> overall, the, uh, the pass rate is way up in the second quarter. Mm -hmm. Is that because people are going to have more time to study, or what, what's the deal on there? It's like, wait, it's 70 percent. We're normally for like 50 something. Yeah, you know, I have a call actually tomorrow with the Board of Examiners um, State Board Committee. So I'm kind of excited to hear what they have to say. The initial feedback on that is that they did pause and they did look into that pretty extensively as to whether they felt that there were any inconsistencies or problems with the exam. And they felt like upon review that there were not any issues that it may be attributed to, like you said, Larry, just more study time available to, to individuals to get through it. But you're right, there was an extensive, uh, a pretty noticeable increase in the pass rate across the country. And probably some had gotten to their test data right before it and then were extended. You know how when you have studied for a test and then if it's postponed and, you know, maybe they got more quality study time. But I, I had opened my mouth to ask the same que question. Uh, Whatever is right, it'd be nice if it could continue. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe these people that are supposed to be working at home are really just studying at home. <laughs> But that's great. Any other questions uh, or comments with respect to Wendy's uh, executive director's report? We do have one action item uh, resulting from that report, which is the need to approve the new proposed meeting date on Tuesday, January 25th, 2022. Um, is there a motion to approve that meeting date? So moved. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. For the motion. Second. Is there any further discussion with respect to the motion to approve the meeting date of January 25th, 2020? If not, take care of the motion. Andy Bonner. Aye. Janet Booker Davis. Aye. Pamela Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Larry Elmore. Aye. Greg Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. Kevin Monroe. Aye. A Moon. Aye. Todd Scott, I'm sorry, Todd is not with us yet. Uh, Judy Weatherby. Aye. Thank you, Karen. The motion passes. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the review and approval of committee assignments. Um, uh, for those that are that are watching uh, on, on the meeting and those in the public, um, um, the the work really of this board is is mildly dependent on the standing committees that we have established to conduct our business, and those committees include the licensing committee law and rules committee and the enforcement committee. And in addition, there is an executive committee which is composed of ex-official ex officers of the board. Um, and so um, you have been sent out a listing of the proposed um, committee assignments. Um, 
Uh, we had asked if you had any preferences to go ahead and let Wendy know, and we very much tried to accommodate any preferences that we received. Uh, but um, at this point, I would ask for a, a motion and a second to approve the committee assignments, and then we'll open it up for discussion. I'll make a motion that we can approve the committee assignments. I'll okay, second. thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve the proposed committee uh, assignments. Is there any further uh, question, comment, or discussion on, on the proposed assignments? Thank you, and just again, thanks to everybody in advance for, for the hard work. Uh, yesterday afternoon was a good example of, of the homework that the committee members uh, need to prepare and, and go through with respect to dealing with the issues that come before their committees, and we'll reprise some of that work um, as we prepare their recommendations for board approval um, for consideration later today. Um, Karen, will you please call the roll on the motion to approve the proposed committee assignments? Andy Bonner. Aye. Janet Booker Davis. Aye. Pamela Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Larry Elmore. Aye. Ed Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. John, we, there you go. Evan Monroe. Aye. Amy Moon. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. Okay, thank you. That motion is approved. Um, the next item uh, on our agenda uh, relates to the reinstatement of ap the reinstatement applications of two different individuals. Um, the first one that we will address is Mark Fontenot, and I apologize, Mark, if I'm, I'm mispronouncing that. Um, uh, but we will turn it over to Wendy and to Maria uh, Bush, our executive, our legal executive director and legal counsel, respectively, to kind of introduce this particular reinstatement application. Thank you, Kevin. I'll start off with um, with this one. So, um, in the documents that I provided to you, is a. Um, a review of the relevant rule. And basically when a suspended or revoked licensee comes before the board, it's a two-step process. So at the first meeting, we evaluate the application for completeness, and we don't really get into the um, actions um, of the individual. We just look to see that the information that you all um, would expect to see in an application is there and anything you would like the board to follow or board staff to follow up on. And then at the second meeting, um, you may ask the individual to attend and answer questions um, related to the reinstatement. And that's where you make the decision on whether to reinstate the individual um, or not. So in this instance, um, Mr. Fontenot, this is the first meeting. So we'll be looking at the application and other documents um, related to, to that, and you will uh, vote to, de to consider it complete, and then let me know whether you would like him to appear at the next meeting for questions. Um, so Mr. Fontenot's license was revoked in 2014. Um, the consent order that was issued at the time is in your documents. And the findings of fact um, indicate that he was um, the served as a treasurer of a nonprofit organization. And while uh, rendering services for this nonprofit organization, he misappropriated $10,000 in funds and converted those funds for personal use. He admitted to the misappropriation of funds um, alleged in the complaint. As a mitigating factor, the respondent paid back all misappropriated funds to the nonprofit and such pay repayment was confirmed in writing by officers of the nonprofit. Um, the consent order indicates that this was violation of several uh, accountancy rules, inclu including dishonesty, fraud, ne gross negligence, performance of any fraudulent act while holding a certificate, and any conduct reflecting adversely on the licensee's fitness to perform services. At the time, the order 
implemented a $5,000 civil penalty, um, completion of two hours of state ethics, and that the license would be suspended for five years. Um, and then the licensee would have an option to request reinstatement from the board. Um, it appears that um, Mr. Fontenot made a pay his initial payment with the consent order. Um, the second payment was due around or at January 31st at 15. That payment was not received timely. And so ultimately the license was revoked for not completing that payment timely. Um, throughout the rest of 2015, um, Mr. Fontenot did make um, all payments and completed that $5,000 civil penalty. And um, today uh, we have received an application where he is requesting reinstatement of that revoked license. And staff has reviewed the application. We do believe that it's complete. We have confirmed um, payments made on the civil penalty. We have confirmed the state ethics course was completed. So I'm happy to take any questions and Maria can help if needed. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, again, this is the, the really the first of two discussions. We won't actually make a decision today on reinstating um, the, the, the licensee, uh, but we are making a decision on the appropriateness of the application package and whether we will proceed then to the second meeting where we will actually consider the reinstatement on its merits. Wendy, I have a question that's kind of a, it's a technicality, but I don't know if it matters or not, but just in the information that we were provided on the schedule of payments, um, the, the letter from Mark Crocker way back then says that the first payment was made upon execution of the agreement, which was in December. <clears throat> but on the schedule of payments over here that Karen provided to us, it says the first payment was made January the 8th. I don't think it matters because the dispute was on the second payment being late. The issue, I mean, but that's just kind of a, those two numbers don't matter. Those two dates don't match. <clears throat> Doesn't matter really, but just curious. You see what I'm talking about? Um, yes. Um... And I'm not sure, um, Karen pulled from the core system, from our system when the payments were made. Um, and I'm not sure yeah. if there is a date issue there or. Yeah, um, I'm, so it doesn't matter because the, the one that was actually late was the second payment. So right. the first one doesn't really matter, but I just want to point that out. And Croc Mr. Crocker's and, late, Mr. Crocker's date may be wrong. He just said upon ex execution, and he may have just been using that term kind of loosely that not necessarily on the date it was executed, but in the general time frame. So and Larry, this is Maria. Um, I just wanted to speak to that. Sometimes because that was like he said it was December 16th, I think, um, was the date, and then that's you know, the state kind of slows down and we shut down for Christmas and through the yeah. new year. And so maybe that was when he had submitted and actually executed the consent order and signed it. And then by the time that it was processed and it has to go through different offices to you know be put in the system as paid, that could have been just a little bit of the delay. I think it was he said it was December 16th, and then in our system it was like in the beginning of January. So I could see where yeah. there might have been a little lapse in just administrative um procedure there. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay. That's all I had. Thank you, Larry. Any other questions or comments for Wendy or Maria with respect to the uh, appropriateness of the reapplication itself? Wendy or Maria, the one, did, when y'all reviewed this file, do you, did you see anything that you felt it may not be complete or maybe missing or do you feel like comfortable that everything is complete? I, I feel like everything's complete. I agree with Wendy as well, yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, any other questions or comments? This this is Janet. Were, did you say the uh, two hours of, of ethics training was also complete? Yes, and we have the certificate is in your document. Okay.
Thank you, Janet. Are there any other questions here for Wendy or Maria? Kevin, I would entertain a motion if that's okay. Yes, sir. To, uh, I guess, to declare this file is deemed complete to allow for the next step to determine whether or not we reinstate his license. Thank you. On tonight. Thank you, Stephen. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Gabe. We have a motion and a second. Um, if there any further discussion? If not, uh, Karen, will you please call the roll on that motion? Andy Bonner. Aye. Janet Booker Davis. Aye. Pamela Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Mary Elmore. Aye. Greg Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. Kevin Monroe. Aye. Moon. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. Thank you, Karen. That motion carries. And uh, Mark or Mr. Fontenot, I, I appreciate your uh, participation in, in this meeting as was earlier outlined. This is the first step of a step process. And so at the subsequent meeting of the Tennessee Board of Accountancy, which will occur, I believe, in January, um, that is where the board will actually consider the reinstatement application on the merits and will make a decision uh, as to whether or not to reinstate your uh, license and or whether more information or action is needed. Uh, so we very much appreciate your attendance today and uh, we look forward to further discussion uh, uh, when we actually have the evaluation of the reinstatement application and the representation at the second of the two meetings that is required under the state and our board procedure. Um, I think we'll go ahead then and proceed to the next reinstatement application. Um, this is actually the second um, part or meeting number two, the board had earlier considered the uh, appropriateness of the completion of the application for reinstatement for purposes of, of presentation at this board meeting. So we are now here to do that. And um, to set this up, I'll also refer to Wendy and to Maria. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so this, Mr. Mr. Sue is on the line here. Um, he is available to answer questions from the board, um, but I would first like to give a brief overview of the memorandum that I sent you all, as well as the documents that were attached. Um, so this, I'm not sure if I've done a Fresh Start Act with um, the board before, um, the accountancy board before. I do it a lot for um, the Motor Vehicle Commission, anyhow. The Fresh Start Act was enacted in 2018, and it's just an additional step that licensing authorities and boards, commissions have to go through um, when assessing a person's either initial licensure, or reinstatement, um, and that if there is a criminal conviction involved, there are certain additional steps that we have to take um, and kind of look at those factors. So I can walk you all through that. And first I'll just give you some um, background information on Mr. Sood and his history with the board. Mr. Sood was first issued a license in June, 1996. Due to criminal convictions, his license was revoked on May 3rd, 2013. The documented convictions include a felony conviction for concealment of assets on October 7th, 2011. Mr. Sood was detained under orders of the United States District Court for the Middle District of Tennessee and served approximately nine months in jail. A plea agreement was entered on June 3rd, 2011, when Mr. Sood pled guilty to count two of the indictment filed against him, charging him with concealment of assets in violation of 18 U.S.C. 1521. On October 7th, 2011, Mr. Sood was sentenced to the nine months already served, a $100 assessment, and three years of supervised release by the United States Probation Office. On May 3rd, 2013, he complied with the terms of his release and his federal supervised and his federal supervised release expired on October 6, 2014. 
Mr. Sue signed an agreed final order with the board wherein his license as a certified public accountant was revoked with ineligibility for an application of reinstatement for at least a two year period. The provision of the order required that Mr. Sue not represent himself to the public as a certified account, public accountant. Upon review by legal counsel and the board's investigator, it was determined that Mr. Sue represented himself as a CPA on his LinkedIn page. However, he has subsequently taken the designation down um, once that we reached out to him and um, notified him of that representation. The relevant statute for determining whether the board has the discretion to deny this application on his convictions is found in TCA 62-1-106, which states, the certificate of certified public accountant shall be granted to persons of good moral character who meet the education, experience, and examination requirements of subsections B through G and who make application for the certificate pursuant to 62-1-107. Good moral, good moral character for purposes of this section means lack of a history of dishonest or felonious acts. So um, I prepared the memorandum for you all, which has the fresh start act factors and the board does have the discretion to deny this, um, but that is ultimately a recommendation and it's up to you all to make that um, final decision. So that is why Mr. Sood is here. Um, you can ask me any questions about this, and you can also, um, I would recommend that you um, ask Mr. Stude about um, any issues uh, that you would like to address. Thank you, Maria. And what I'd like to do, I suspect that there may be several board members that have questions of either Mr. Stude or Maria, you or Wendy with respect to this matter. So in order to kind of prevent talking over one another and to keep the WebEx you know, presentation clear, what I'm going to ask that you do is, is just use the chat function and, and send the chat to everyone and just say, I have a question, um, and then I'll recognize you in the order that they come in, and we'll just continue through uh, until members have a chance to um, kind of uh, raise their, their questions, and then we can discuss and ultimately vote. Uh, Stephen, I see that you've um, indicated you have a question. Please go ahead. Thank you, Kevin. Maria, I've got a question for you. Can you just clarify the date? I noticed that, um, I just lost my page. When did the LinkedIn violation happen where he represented himself as a CPA? I assume that was after he completed his sentence and, and everything else, but yes, so, between then and now. Um, I was looking, yeah, so I was looking at the consent order before um, our board meeting. It was probably, you know, late September, or early October, just reviewing his um, online representation and there was, um, that was on his LinkedIn. Um, I can let Mr. Stu speak to this, but he was very um, prompt in wanting to correct that. He said that um, there are other people who manage social media and that his prior credentials were provided. Um, and that's why he was, I think the person who was running his social media had just kept it on there and he sent me correspondence between the parties asking them, you know, please take this down, um, that he had instructed them not to put that. So, um, but since then it's been taken down, I don't know if you'd like to ask him about what exactly happened, but that's what I was told. I would, but first, is this something that we determined that was there or was this self-reported? No, we determined. Um, I looked and then Sherry followed up as well. Okay. Mr. C, can you kind of give us an ex explanation as far as the what happened and timeline? Okay. You guys back, I had asked somebody to do a LinkedIn page for me, and I had even forgotten about that. I never even used that. And then most recently it surfaced again. I did not even know that I was on LinkedIn. And I've never used that as a business tool anyway. So I corrected it right away because I was not even aware that I had a LinkedIn page until somebody told me about that. So somebody started working on that, and then I found that. Well, I, I found out through Maria, actually. Thank you, Mr. Sood. I mean, I'm, I'm being real truthful about that. I can say that. Thank you. Um, are there other board member questions either for Mr. Sood or for uh, Wendy or for Maria? If you'll just use the chat function so that I can kind of uh, recognize everybody in order, that, that would be appreciated. Uh, Larry, go ahead. Okay, um, 
My question is on the, um, the the reinstatement application itself, which I know we've already talked about that, but I'm a little bit confused. Um, I may have brought this up back when we looked at the application, but on the on the application for the firm pimp permit, it says, are you currently licensed? And it says no. On the application for the license itself, or it says, are you currently licensed? And it says yes. So a little bit of inconsistency there. And I think we talked about the fact that once you're issued a license, people get confused that I still have a license, but it's been revoked, but I have a license number. So, you know, is there an issue there that we need to maybe amend this application in the future as far as the way people are answering it? Yes, it So, So let me speak to that real quickly. Um, those, the, the two sheets where that question is asked are, are cover sheets. And when mail comes into this building, it goes to the mail room and you have folks not associated with our board who have to process it. And mm -hmm. so typically that is an attempt to direct it to the correct place and get the correct application created in our system. And so it's just extremely helpful to have the license number of the person that you're connecting it to. So, um, you know, it, I don't think it's an official um, question meant to trick the person one way or the other. And he, and he will always have that particular number associated with him. We don't give him a new number. Um, so I think we did talk about this at the last meeting. So it, there's probably not a good way to amend it. We do need that type of information to help get the documents where they need to go when they come to the building. Yeah, I was just saying one of them's answered no and one of them's answered yes. As far as do you have yeah. a lot of Thank you, Larry. Are there uh, other questions by board members? Kevin, I have another question. Sorry. Yes, please go ahead, Stephen. Ray, have we, what, Mr. C, what's your, who's your current employer? What's that? Who's your current lawyer? Oh, I'm self-employed. I, I do some QuickBooks accounting work. Self you have the websites and social media for, for all that? I just set up one about a month back. It's called uh, Crunch Cloud Accounting. Crunch Cloud Accounting. Okay. Maria, have we reviewed all that? Is it current website and um, social media to make sure that it's compliant with our rules? So we have, and Sherry pointed this out to me, there was um, the spelling on the website is accounting, account, I can't really say it, but it's <laughs> accounting, I think. Um, so it's not accounting. Um, so there was a little bit of gray area there. Um, if Sherry, can you speak a little bit to what you found too, and she's Sherry brought this to my attention in her review of his records. Um, when we go to the um, to the uh, individual website for the firm, um, sometimes he will use the, the 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 term crunch cloud accounting, but sometimes uh, it'll say, and I think at the web page itself, the name of the firm is crunch cloud accountanting. Uh, say accountant with an ing at the end. So I did raise that as a question of whether that might be a potential violation of using that in the firm name because it is restricted to CPAs. And that was as of, I'm looking at this October 1st when I did that review. So is that, is that allowed under our rules to kind of circumvent the, I mean, it seems a little bit to me that you're kind of circumventing the, the rule by misspelling it or whatever. We we don't regulate, you know, it's hard to say because by the letter of the law, we don't regulate accounting. I cannot say the word, I'm really sorry. Um, accounting, um, but as far as holding out as, you know, accounting services, we do regulate that and that would be a violation. Mr. Sue, what's your, what was your intention of using that Terminology through your name, account, whatever accounting. Was it an intent? Was it an intention to 
get around the rules so you don't use the word account it or no, the spelling that, or that was never the intent because uh, you know i just do like cookbooks accounting uh, and I, I thought i could represent myself like doing accounting work for small businesses and and basically accounting is moving to cloud accounting so uh, i didn't know whether that was you know but that that was not the intent because I thought you could still do accounting work, like QuickBooks accounting. You know, I thought you know that's what I'm saying. So was that a misspelling? You you intended to use the word accounting? Is that what I'm understanding? Uh, 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 yeah, uh, cloud accounting. Yes. But your intent was to use the word accounting. Uh, I, I guess QuickBooks accounting. You know, for example. So. I'll ask cloud accounting is QuickBooks accounting also. I want to say accounting is migrating to the cloud and is cloud accounting. Yeah. So can a non CPA use the word accounting on their website for any reason? Just make it sure. So the way that we've treated it in the past is you can't say that you are provide, uh, in the name that it's accounting, you know, Maria Bush accounting services. But if one of my services includes accounting services, um, then that is appropriate. So we've had in the past, um, we've had people who don't have licenses with, licenses with the board. And if they have accounting in their name, usually it's if they're cooperative, it's a letter of warning or a letter of instruction, you know, referencing that you can't use accounting in your name. That's how we treat that with violations. So just for clarity, can you restate what the name of his company or firm is? So two are used, um, Sherry, just put it in the chat, um, Crunch Cloud. Accounting is used as well as Crunch Cloud um, accounting. Which he said was a misspelling. Um, yeah, that's a that's a typo. I, I just happened to see that, and uh, it's a typo. So that should both be crunch cloud accounting. Yes. Which is the name of his business. I have uh, yes. questions. Thank you, Stephen. I have questions first from uh, Janet Booker Davis, and then from Judy Weatherby. So, Janet, first to you. Okay, uh, Mr. Sood, could you just talk about what what it was that motivated you to end up in this situation and how you wouldn't be motivated in the future to end up in a the same or similar uh, situation? Well, I had filed, I, I had some business problems and with my wife and business problems. So I had filed for a bankruptcy and forgot there was an account that got omitted. There was no money in it. And they, they held me for a felony lying for, on application for bankruptcy. So that's how I ended up in the situation. And it, it went all the way, whatever I went through, you know, that's how it was. And while I was doing accounting, I never did anything like any public funds or any any embezzlement or anything like that. Anybody's funds, I never cheated or anything like that. So I don't think this, this could happen again. So, I'm sorry, you said that that uh, this was account an account that you forgot to include and it had no money. Account. It was a, a bank account, yes. Yeah, but the, the bank account was in the UK. Mm. And no, no funds in it, and and you just forgot yeah. Yeah. in the information. Yeah. So would the takeaway then be that as long as you didn't have any business problems, then you shouldn't find yourself in the situation again? 
But I Which would imply that, that if you did have a business problem, then. Well, what I'm saying is it was just a filing for bankruptcy and an account got did not got registered. And sometimes you have to think and take your time and filing the paperwork. And sometimes you just do it in, in a casual way and you, you end up in trouble. That sort of thing. It was negligence on my part, I think. Hmm. Thank you, Janet. Judy, I think you're next up in the queue here for your question. Okay, first I have a question for Maria um, and for Wendy, probably. Um, is the use of, um, in describing oneself or on a website or whatever, saying that they're a former CPA, is that, um, I, I would, I, I don't know legally and mm -hmm. if that's acceptable or not. And I, I do, I have seen where that's been used. And I want to know if, if, if someone that's been revoked can hold themselves out as a former CPA. Judy, I haven't actually run into that um, question before, but the specific language for Mr. Stude in this situation was that he would not represent himself, the public as a CPA um, currently licensed. So I'm happy to you know, do some research on that specific issue, but as far as Mr. Stude goes, um, I don't think he represented as a former CPA. Um, so oh. the prohibition on his title usage was for um, just representing himself as a CPA generally. Okay, because I, I mean, I, I've, in my, in my looking at his, at some stuff on the web, I have, um, I've come across where it says as a former CPA and auditor for the state of Tennessee, I have substantial experience. In other words, he's explaining his um experience and background and and to me that's very dicey when you say you're a former cpa when you've been revoked um it, it gives I, i'm i'm concerned about the public not understanding what former cpa means and how that may be explained to them um i would i don't know what the rules say but for as far as protecting the public goes, I feel like that misre misrepresents um, what was actually going on when his license was revoked. So um, if you need me to point you to that or whatever, I can do that. But um, is that, Mr. Sood, is that how you uh, represented yourself to the public as a former CPA? Well, first of all, you know, I don't do a lot of work on online and all that, but sometimes you may have said that, something like that, but uh, I don't think I represent that, uh, or at least I, I'm not aware of that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Here. Okay. Uh, and Judy, our um, rules don't reference you know former cpa i mean he was a former cpa that's a true statement but um when i brought it to the attention that he was holding out even a current cpa he yeah um, amended that so okay and, uh, thanks uh, judy the, the kind of the order of questions i have coming in are next up is larry followed by todd larry go ahead yeah, I, I may have answered my own question. I'm just, when Mr. Sood said a while ago that there was no money in that account, I think, I think technically what happened was, if I understand it right, there was, there was money in the account, but then subsequently, during the process of filing the bankruptcy application, he transferred that money to his son. Is that right? And then, so that created the, the zero balance in the account. But prior to that, there was like 150,000 in there. Is I, am I understanding that right? Uh, yes. Uh I don't know whether I transferred the money after that or, but basically, 
you know, I don't, I don't recall it, it happened in 2005. I don't, I don't recall whether it transferred before that or after that. Yeah, so Maria, the I think the question is, in the document that I'm reading, I think the, the point is that by transferring that, there was a potential intent to conceal that asset from the bankruptcy court. Is that, is that the point? Uh, that, that's not, the conviction. I'm sorry. That was the conviction, yes, Larry. The concealment okay. of assets was the conviction that the court entered. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Larry. Next question is Todd, and then following Todd is Janet Booker Davis and then Pam Church. Todd? Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, sir. Um, my understanding from the, the Southern District of California documents um, wasn't the issue of when the transfer occurred, but just simply that the account and the $156,000 balance was concealed. So continuing on the prior line. How, so how do you, given that the plea agreement that, that you signed says it provides that balance, the $156,000, explain to me how you reconcile that with your statement here that it contained no funds? Well, I don't know, but basically, first of all, all the money I had, the bankruptcy trustee took it. So, and so I, I had no funds. But again, I don't know when, when the transfer took place and all that. That I've really forgotten. Well, either there was no money there, but eventually I think I turned everything into the U.S. Uh, bankruptcy trustee. And the problem, I, I, I tell you why I got into this problem. The bankruptcy trustee had I had nine hundred ninety nine thousand dollars in the account, and he he would he would not account for half a million dollars because he paid all my debts, and then he would not he would not give me a discharge in bankruptcy, and as my attorney had told me that we are going to request that the bankruptcy not proceed because we'll settle the money out of whatever he had collected, but basically he, he had half a million dollars. And I asked him for an accounting, and then I found myself in trouble. The records can show that because half a million dollars, he would not give me any accounting, and I, you know, that's what that, that's why I ended up, you know. Does that, to clarify my understanding, does that mean the the trustee retaliated for ask, you're asking for an accounting? Yes. Because even today, my, my bankrupt, uh, you can look at the records of I had like $999,000. He had collected from all these sources and he paid all my debtors and all that. And then he ended up with half a million dollars in his account and he would not give me any accounting. I mean, I'm not making it up. It's, it's in the records there. Um, my second question, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Um, I missed a, a few of the introductory comments, and for that, I apologize. Um, but could you, and, and if if I missed it, um, would you mind to stay? But if if it wasn't covered, could you briefly explain? You know, since over the last few years, any um, since the time of the conviction or guilty plea, your efforts in you know professional advancement and other rehabilitation uh, type. Uh, mitigation that we might want to consider? Well, it's, it's been a rough ride. All I can say that, and I had eventually been able to get this education. Somehow, I just want to get my education back because, you know, it's not an easy thing when you lose everything you had in your life and then you, you lose everything, you, you got to start all over again. And at least I think I should get my education back. And once again, I would say I did not use anybody's money and pocket myself. In it. That's all I'm saying. So no, um, no activities, you know, professionally, 
development or service in the community or anything else that you would want to uh, call to the attention of the board? Well, one of the things that I actually do is uh, there's a lot of people out there uh, who can't afford. Uh, I like to prepare their taxes for free. You know, I think I like to offer this service to the public. Yeah. All right. Thank you, sir. That concludes my questions. Thank you, Todd. Uh, the next uh, one is Janet Booker Davis to be followed by Pam Church. Janet. Um, you know, when I asked you a few minutes ago about um, um, what motivated you and so forth, and you said there was no money in the account. And when you said that, I guess it struck me as odd that you would have such a penalty for concealing an account that had no money in it. But, you know, looking in, in the documents, it, it says that the account had the $156,000 in it. And I guess transferred to your son and whatnot. Um, I, think I recall that it was in my son's account in UK. It was not in, in my account yet. Yeah. I, 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 I guess, I guess he, so. Um, just asking you now, it kind of sounds like um, in, in your response to my earlier question that. I guess I say I would find your answer troubling. I'll just say that. And then you mentioned that uh, the bankruptcy in investigator or person handling that uh, would not give you an accounting related to a five hundred thousand um, dollars. So, so what ultimately happened with this half a million dollars? Nothing. He kept. It. If I understood you correctly. Yeah. Basically, this is how it got started because all I asked him was, I need an accounting because he had paid all my bills and everything. And he, he did not even discharge me. He did not give me a discharge in bankruptcy and all that. So all I asked him was an accounting. And then I heard from the FBI, they said, they are telling me that they are investigating the bankruptcy trustee. We need your cooperation. So they came by the house and they uh, they, they came from uh, California and then they arrested me. So, so are you saying the bankruptcy trustee misappropriated yeah. five hundred thousand uh, dollars? I'm so scared to use words like misappropriated and all that. Okay. But what is it? it didn't what, give you an account of that. Yeah. What is that, Winston? I mean, as simple as that, you know. And, and you know. Uh, I mean, that's all I can say. Hmm. Okay, um, thank members, you. I just want to maybe provide a little bit of clarification. I know um, sometimes these matters can get kind of um, complicated. So I just want to make sure everybody is on the same page that we have to, the board has to look at the convictions from the court. Um, and it is important to understand the background and Mr. C's side of the story. and. Um, what he has done since to rehabilitate himself and um, that sort of thing. However, I just want to read the conviction um, that was entered by the court and that Mr. Sood agreed to so that everyone can be on the same page as to what um, what occurred. So it's um, 18 USCA 152. It's concealment of assets, false oath claims, and bribery. And this is under the bankruptcy portion of the statute. A person. So it is an offense for a person who knowingly and fraudulently conceals from a custodian, trustee, marshal, or other officer of the court charged with the control or custody of property or in connection with a case under Title 11 from creditors of the United States trustee, any property belonging to the estate of a debtor. Um, so we're not really here to um, question Mr. Sud on whether or not that no, uh, that he knowingly and fraudulently concealed assets, but rather um, how we can proceed and knowing that the public is protected um, moving forward since the 2005 concealment. I, I hope that helps um, in kind of directing where our conversation should go. Thank you, Maria. Um, yeah, uh, I like go ahead, Mr. Sood. I like to, I had filed for bankruptcy and my attor attorney had told me that we are going to Ask for them to cancel the bankruptcy, which I also filed. 
But the court said, no, we cannot take it back. So see, you finally filing and the court did not, did not want to take it back. That, because my attorney had told me that you don't need to file a bankruptcy. That, that's what I think. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sood. Uh, the next questions are in order, uh, Pam Church, followed by Dane Moon. Pam, go ahead. Um, Maria, I realize that this is um, in line with what you were saying about what about the um, conviction against him, but on page two of uh, Jesse Joseph's letter, the language is very concerning and does not coincide with what Mr. Sood said about this being an accidental omission. Because, of course, as you say, in keeping with that part of the law, I, I, I'm sure um, it says he specifically admitted that he knowingly and fraudulently concealed an asset, offshore accounts in Channel Islands, $156,000 for the purpose of fraudulently concealing the offshore accounts and the money contained within them, um, and also admitted that his concealment contained within them was material and that he used sophisticated means during the commission of this offense. That does not coincide in my mind with what we've heard uh, from Mr. Sood, and I guess um, whoever would be appropriate to address that is that part of the legal process that, um, you know, just sort of the, the deal that was made with the, um, the official people, or, you know, is this something that it's concerning to me? And I guess I want to hear something to explain why it should not be. Well, uh, one thing they told me, they offer you a, a guilty plea so you, you, you're better off taking that and then you don't look at because you, you're in jail. There's not a lot of options there. So you, you accept whatever they offer you. And that's that's what it was. Thank you, Mr. Sue. Yes, Maria, you were gonna make a comment. Thank you, Kevin. Um, yes, so Mr. Sood, um, like he said, he does have his side of what occurred. The board is going to be held, the board is charged, Mr. Sood, with protecting the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of Tennessee and regulating the profession of CPAs and firms in that profession. So the official court records and documents that we have, the board is charged with looking at that and taking it as fact that it occurred. And because we have documentation that you agreed to, as well as the judge stating that the elements are there was an existence of a bankruptcy, the defendant knowingly and fraudulently concealed an asset of the bankruptcy estate and concealment was material. The board is held to that high um, standard of protecting the citizens. And so that documentation we take is um, very seriously and that that is true and correct what transpired. Now the board in order to grant your license has to have sufficient information or um, facts at that they feel it is okay to proceed in granting your reinstatement and that it would be in the best interest of the public to do so. So um, we're not really arguing today whether or not we have documentation already showing that there was a knowing and fraudulent concealment of bankruptcy assets. Um, that is just, an, that's an established fact and we have to go off that documentation. So. Moving forward, um, the board just needs to kind of question about how, whether or not granting the reinstatement would be appropriate based off of what they know now. Does that help? Yes, thank you, Maria. Um, the next questions are Gay Moon followed by Larry Elmore. Gay, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Maria, this is kind of for you and Sharon. I want to make sure I understand his firm name. Was that Crunch Accounting Services or was that just embedded in his website? I think I'm not sure which was the actual name because those were present on the website. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's account 
accounting or account, accounting. Um, but I think we established earlier that that was, I guess it was supposed to be um, accounting regardless. Okay. And the only thing I would add to that, Gay, is when you go to the web address itself, it's accountant instead of accountanting. So I would, I, under that assumption only, I would say that the 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 uh, intention was to be crunch cloud accounting. So, He's not a firm, so we don't have a registered firm because he can't be a CPA firm. Okay, and so when you checked this. That was earlier this month or last month, or when did you when did you find this to happen? Um, I did this verification for Maria on October 1st of this year. So we don't know that could have been sitting there on his website. The whole time he's been as a revoked CPA license. Um, that is possible. Um, I, I don't know the date that the firm was um, initially established. Um, I can look real quick and see from the LinkedIn page if there's some indication of that. You'll give me just a second. Okay. I apologize. The system is a little slow. Um, it looks like from his LinkedIn page that that firm was in existence since April of 2017. Okay, so he's been identifying himself as an accountant for quite a while. I would and say the, the, fir the firm name, uh, the, the, the firm name is using a restricted term since April of 2017, yes. Okay. Thank you. That's that's all I needed. You're welcome. Thank you, Gay. Uh, next, we have questions from Larry Elmore and then Stephen Eldridge. Larry, I don't have any further questions. I think some my, my question got answered amongst all these others. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Stephen, I got one quick question for clarity. So, Mr. Sood, you said. Back when they identified your assets, you had when they identified nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars of assets. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. And you said that after after all your debts were paid, there was five hundred thousand dollars remaining thereabouts. Correct. I don't. I can't get to that number. I was just reading the. Uh, bear with me. I was reading the agreed final order from. I guess it was received on May the third of two thousand thirteen. And it said that you had identified a total debt of seven seventy seven four zero three fifty nine. What's the what? What am I? What's the difference there? Well, I don't have anything in front of me because all I know is I didn't have that big a debt. And once all my properties were sold and all that, there was a property I had in California and the property I have in Nashville. Once they were sold, the, all those assets and all the cash was was given to the bankruptcy trustee and you know my, my debts were not more than say two hundred thousand dollars and then somebody has sued me that's that's what led me to file for bankruptcy and it, it was like i forget in the amount it was like it was like two or three hundred thousand dollars they paid that also out of that so right now i don't have everything in front of me but basically uh, my, my debts were not even that high, you know. They were like half million. Okay, I'm just going from the section two. Uh, it references case number 051239-6-7. In which he listed approximately 48 creditors and a total debt of 777-403.59. So $777,403.59. Pretty big difference. I'm just kept trying to figure out what. What I'm missing there. Well, okay. From even if, if the figure that came up with a nine hundred ninety nine thousand dollars, and you are saying you you show a debt of like seven fifty. I'm saying that the order that you signed says yeah. seven hundred thousand plus of debt. Yeah. Okay. Right. But it still leaves three hundred thousand. I'm saying, to tell you the truth. You know. Okay. I mean, you said five hundred thousand. I'm just trying okay. to get back to that number. Okay, there's a secure debt and an unsecured debt. 
So all of it got paid. Okay, it just says total debt. So I'm just trying to clarify that. Thank you, Stephen. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know. Um, you know, it's been a while back, but I can't. Go ahead. Mr. Sue, this is Kevin um, Monroe. I, I have a question kind of that gets to the, the basis yes, of which the board needs to try to make a decision here. And the decision for us is whether or not to reinstate your CPA license. Yes, sir. And, you know, the criteria of that decision under the statute and under past board precedent has been essentially, you know, when, when there has been a past violation, and in this case, this involves revocation of your license due to basically concealment and falsehood. Um, you know, those are very serious, you know, violations in my mind, at least in terms of should a CPA be doing that kind of behavior? And, and if it has occurred in the past, you know, why is it now or, or what has changed that says, why should the board reinstate you given the, the past deeds that clearly involved falsehood and concealment that, that you agreed to in, in the court order? Can you give us you know, your, your view on that. Uh, let me think about that. Uh, let me talk to John. Okay, I think I've served, uh, I think I've paid my dues in a way uh, and all, and I think all I want to say was I like to, get my education back if I could. Uh, that's all I'm asking because uh, I think I, you know, what I've been through, I've paid my dues and I spent time in jail. I, I, I have to try to get, make a living when the, the possibilities for a job are very, very limited with a felony background. So I, I was just trying to, try to get my education back and I like to, I, I have not been in trouble since then. And I just want to, uh, you know, uh, that's all I can say. I just like to get the lessons back if I can get it back. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sood. Uh, the, the next uh, person, uh, Judy Weatherby, has indicated she would like to go ahead and, and, and make a motion or call the question. So, Judy, I'll turn the floor over to you. We'll, if there is a second, we'll deal with that and then have discussion before we would vote. Judy, go ahead. Um, I would like to make a motion to deny reinstatement of the license of Mr. Sood. Okay. Thank you, Judy. Is there a second to that motion? And then we will have discussion uh, before there is any vote. I'll second the motion. So we have a motion and a second to deny reinstatement of the license. Uh, thank you, uh, Judy and John. Is there further discussion or other questions or comments? Okay, at this time, Karen, I'm gonna ask that you call the roll on the motion, which would be to deny reinstatement uh, of Mr. Sue's license. Andy Bonner. Nay. Uh, let me just clarify the voting here. So the motion is to deny reinstatement. So if you wish to deny reinstatement, vote yes. If you do not wish to deny reinstatement, vote no. Okay, just to clarify. Mr. Bonner. Nay. Um, Janet Booker Davis. Karen, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Sorry? I think Janet had, a, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I think Janet had a question maybe in the discussion portion before we started voting. I did. Go ahead, Janet. Mm -hmm. Uh, my, my question is, I don't think there's a requirement to have a, a, a CPA license to do QuickBooks accounting. So would you intend to do QuickBooks accounting regardless of whether you have a license or not? Am I correct on my, my thinking, Wendy? Well, you know, I'm not I mean, you know, you can... It's basically a software you're selling. So you're looking at the software. And I didn't think, 
I, I'm not holding myself out like a CPA. So unless I get an order not to do that, I won't do it. But I don't think uh, cookbooks require a, a, a CPA license. Right, and I, I, I agree with that. So my question was, do you intend to do QuickBooks accounting without a CPA license? So let me check. Yes, I would like to do that. Okay. One, one other clarification, Maria and Wendy. Um, right now, the license is in a revoked status. That is correct, right? So as I think through the motion to deny reinstatement, I think we can do that, but effectively we don't have to act to deny reinstatement because the license is already revoked. I guess the board would have to act in order to affirmatively reinstate Mr. Stude's license. Um, is that an appropriate description, Maria? So Kevin, um, I was actually gonna get to that after um, Judy's motion if it passed because because of this the fresh start act we actually do have to have a full analysis and we the board needs to um, affirmatively deny the reinstatement um and then okay. i'll go through some factors with the board if that passes so i'll be happy to walk you guys through that okay maria thank you for that clarification um uh, at this point before we complete our vote and we'll go back and reread the motion is there any further question, comment, or discussion from board members? Yes, I have a question or just a comment. Uh, yeah, in, go in, ahead, Andy. You know, in looking through it, uh, uh, Mr. Sud is, is is paid for his crime. Um, I, I, my, my biggest challenge here is, is that does he understand coming forward uh, that he needs to be extremely careful and and own the fact that that something was done wrong, um, and then you know and then represent himself as a CPA um, ethically in our profession. Uh, so uh, as I look at it, I, I think that you know uh, that from my seat that he, he's paid he's paid for his crime, he's done his time, uh, and that um, you know that. He's come before us in the second reading to to get that license back, and and I just think that it that he should have that second chance. Um, but that's just my seat. Thank you, Andy and uh, Stephen. I see that you you have a comment. I do, Maria. One question. I'm sorry if you you may have intentions on answering this, but let's just say this is this uh, we don't. We continue to have the revoke license under this Fresh Start Act. How how soon could he reapply or to get his license reinstated? There's nothing in our law and rules that has a timeline on how soon someone can reapply. Um, but given the board's decision, uh, that's a good indicator of whether or not a you know another um, reapplication would be successful. So he could turn around tomorrow and you know reapply if he'd like. However. Um, I would also like to make the board aware that in the event that the license reinstatement is denied today, Mr. Sood will have the opportunity to appeal the board's decision um, within 30 days to the local um, court. Can I address Mr. Sood? Yes. yes. I, I guess what I want to say to you is regardless of the outcome here, I, I would just recommend that you go and, and really dig into our laws to make sure that you're compliant with our accountancy rules as far as operating your business and you know whether or not you hold yourself out to be an accountant or a past accountant or whatever or past cpa or like that that sort of thing i think that's that's the biggest issue in my opinion is that intentional or not it's just not following our rules is is in my opinion a, a risk to the general public yeah. well i don't hold myself i'm not going to hold myself out like a CPA, but I think I, I would call myself an account that I do accounting work. Yeah, I don't have accounting in, in your in your business name. That's my understanding of that. Like I said, I, I'm, I'm you know regardless of the outcome, if it, it's not reinstated, I hope you'll review the laws and uh, consider re reapplying. And if it is reinstate, if it is reinstated, then regardless, I think you can just review the laws as well. 
All right. Well, is there anything you can think of that I may be violating? Yes, Mr. Shud, uh, I think the, the concern has been expressed that that uh, what's being violated here when you use the word accounting or accountant in your business name, yeah. that is holding yourself out as an accountant. And when you are not a CPA, a properly licensed CPA, that is in and of itself a potential violation of the uh, of the state rules that we're that we're dealing with here. That's the issue. Uh, are there any other board member comments or questions? Larry, I believe you have a comment or a question. Yeah, I, I would just like for Maria to clarify, if you vote yes, you're voting yes to deny reinstatement, and if you're voting no, you're voting to reinstate, basically. That's a little bit confusing. A vote for yes would be to support the um, motion to deny in the event that there's not enough votes for the motion to deny um, to pass, and we would need uh, someone else to make a motion to grant the reinstatement. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a quick question. I, I think Stephen asked a, a, an excellent a question on the uh, on the name in the firm, and I I had been misled, I misunderstood, I guess, and that I thought Maria had said that that the way that it was done, that they didn't really find anything wrong there. Uh, but I guess I just totally misunderstood that. So the way that he's practicing right now, that using accounting in the firm name, do we are we stating that he, that is uh, not allowed? Um, Because he misspelled it, so I I, I kind of came across that you know what was the intent and that technically it's not. Uh, well, that that website is called Cloud Crunch Cloud Accounting. Uh, nobody's I'm not holding myself out like a CPA. Uh, and why would you have problem with that? Because you you can do you can call yourself an accountant. But not as CPA. Um, so, Mr. Stude, I think there might be some confusion on your part. Um, our law and rules state that unless you are a CPA or have a firm license as well, you can't have accounting or accountant in your business name. You can state to the public that you offer accounting services, but you can't have that in your name because that would be representing to the public that you are an accountant. Okay. Well, I think you talk about the bookkeeping, though. I guess that's the only thing I can think of. Okay. That wouldn't be a problem if I start calling it bookkeeping service, right? No, and that wouldn't be a problem. You can offer accounting services to the public. Um, you can't stay in your business name, Crunch Cloud Accounting. That's a violation of our law and rules. Let me change that from. Mm -hmm. I will change that from. In the, um, I will change that from. Okay. And I just want to make note that in the disposition of the consent order on page eight, um, it said provision three states that you would not, um, you would cease and desist from offering accounting services to the public. So that was laid out in the consent order. Hey, thank you, Maria. Are there any uh, further questions or comments before we proceed to the vote on the motion before the floor? Does, um, this is Todd, does Fresh Start Act analysis have to occur before our vote? Or what's the, Maria, you know the um, process, I guess you were explaining. I was just curious, before we can vote to deny, don't we have to do that analysis or what's the appropriate procedure there? And I, I'll go through it after the denial. Didn't you already do, didn't you, didn't you already do that, Maria, at the beginning? That was just explaining the memorandum, but we have to have every single factor um, the board has to discuss and um, those on the record. So first, okay. I'll need a motion to deny. Well, what if we don't deny? 
then we don't have to go, then I would need a motion to grant reinstatement. And if that passes, we wouldn't have to go to the fresh start at factors. Okay, so you know, right now we have a motion uh, before the board, which is to deny reinstatement that's been properly made and seconded. Is there any further discussion on the motion itself that we uh, have before us? Just as a reminder, if you vote yes on the motion, you are voting to deny reinstatement of Mr. Sood's license. And if you're voting no, then you're, uh, you're uh, choosing to vote to currently not deny, but a second motion would have to be granted to grant reinstatement if it gets that far. So again, a, a motion, a vote yes is a vote to deny reinstatement uh, with respect to this. Is everybody clear? Okay, Karen, will you please call the roll? Andy Bonner. Aye. Janet Booker Davis. No. Pamela Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Larry Elmore. Aye. Greg Gilbert. Aye. On Greaseback. Aye. Kevin Monroe. Aye. A Moon. Aye. Matt Skelton. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. we have 10 ayes and one nay. Okay. So at this point, the motion to deny reinstatement passes. And Maria, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for a follow up with respect to other matters concerning this. Uh, item. Great. Thank you, Kevin. And just bear with me all. This is very procedural. So um, some of it may seem redundant, but we do need motions on uh, everything that I go through. So first, we will need a motion and a vote that the specific criminal conviction discussed of concealment of assets directly relates to the practice of accountancy. Is there a motion? Directly relates. So moved. Second. For a second. Okay, we have a second for further comment or discussion. I'll second. When, when, when you say directly relates, what, what does that mean exactly? Um, just that the elements of the crime that we have discussed um, bear on the individual's capacity and ability to carry out the functions of the profession of accountancy in a, um, in a way that the board feels it protects the health, of safety, and welfare of the citizens of Tennessee. Okay, thanks. So, so what are we voting on? Could you read that again, please? I'm sorry. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the motion is that the specific criminal conviction of concealment of assets directly relates to the practice of accountancy. Just to provide some context here, what we're doing is going through the factors that are required by the fresh start rules, essentially, where we have we make a finding of fact on each separate item. Is that right? Maria, is that correct? That is correct, Kevin. Okay. okay. So this is one of the first of several factors that we'll have to specifically affirmatively vote on um, in order to proceed. Um, is there any further question or comment? And Maria, if you could read the uh, motion one more time. Yes, this motion is to um, that the specific criminal conviction of concealment of assets directly relates to the practice of accountancy. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion in a second. Is there any further discussion? Karen, will you please call the roll? Andy Bonner. Aye. 
Janet Booker Davis. Aye. Pamela Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Larry Elmore. Aye. Mark Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. Kevin Monroe. Aye. Jay Moon. Aye. Todd Skelton. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. Thank you, Karen. It appears that that motion is passed. Maria, what was the next item? Great, thank you. Secondly, we will go through the fresh start analysis and have six factors that we can discuss on the record. Um, it's important that we discuss each factor and why it applies. And then at the end of the discussion of those, that is when the motion will take place. And just for context for the board, because this denial, I mean, this is um, an individual, um, you know, right of Mr. Sood, and he does have the ability um, to um, appeal this decision. So it's important that the board discusses on the record why the decision was made and how the board got to this decision. So it doesn't require a lot of discussion. However, um, just if anyone has input for each of the factors that I discussed. Also, these were outlined um, in the memorandum that I sent you all in advance, the Fresh Start um, Fresh Start Act Analysis Memorandum. So those are just some suggestions of how these um, factors might play out, but I'll let the board um, answer each. So the first is the nature and seriousness of the crime for which the individual was convicted. And Kevin, I'll let you um, kind of manage who can speak when, if that's okay, um, but this is our first factor. So it's the nature and seriousness of the crime for which the individual was convicted. Okay, so Maria, just to clarify, you want us to have discussion on each factor and then vote after yes. the six factors are presented and discussed? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so I guess um, we'll open it up. Are there, there comments from board members with respect to that first factor um, that was read? And Maria, could you read that one more time? Absolutely. Um, the nature and seriousness of the crime for which the individual was convicted. I think I'll just go ahead and mention from my perspective that you know, the nature of this crime was basically relating to concealment and, and falsehood. And those are direct um, relevant uh, attributes that would be considered in the granting of a license or a reinstatement of a license due to the fact that integrity is such a, 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 an integral part of practice in the profession. That would be my, my comment or view. Uh, any further comments or, or views on that by other board members? Uh, I 100% agree with you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, um, and, and just to add, and another discerning factor is, is that uh, as we discussed uh, those issues today, that there there seemed to be uh, uh, no ownership of the fact that uh, currently today in, in discussion with Mr. Sue that, that that everything was exactly what he agreed to in the plea, and so and that bothered me too uh, because we have the plea agreement and that's a fact of law. Thank you, Andy. Okay, are we ready Kevin, to move on is, to the second factor? That would be good. Thank you, Kevin. Um, the second factor is the length of time since the commission of the crime. Um, and just for your reference, the um, the crime occurred on or about October 13th, 2005. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I think just again from from my perspective, you know, 15 years, um, you know, that's a fairly long period of time. I would agree with that. Um, but at the same time, part of the issue is that the consent order, you know, in terms of practicing appropriately or refraining from practicing appropriately has continued to, to be essentially violated. Um, and to me, it's important that this gets to integrity and, and concealment and falsehood. And those are are items where 
I think, you know, the board asked several questions about what has occurred in the meantime to mitigate against the violations that occurred or to show development um, from the, the time at which the violations occurred. And just as a personal viewpoint, I didn't really you know, get a terribly robust response uh, with respect to the questions that, that Todd and other board members put along those lines. Um, are, are there other comments from board members with respect to that factor? Kevin, I would, I would echo. Go ahead, Stephen. Sorry, I would echo what you said, and and just to, to reiterate, I think that from my perspective, that whether intentional or not, I think that there needs to be a, uh, a better understanding and better compliance with our accountancy rules. Which, I mean, that's ultimately our responsibility as board members is to protect the general public. And a practitioner who's not Complying with our rules, in my opinion, is 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 a is a problem and can be a problem for the public. Thank you, Stephen and Judy. You had a comment. I, I do. I I just um, in in looking at the entire situation in Mr. Uh, Sood's comments, I, I'm not sure that he fully understands. I mean, he's he still uses the term accountant, senior accountant, accounting, and um, even though he's not to hold himself out as such, and I, I, not even sure that he fully comprehends that those are wrong things. Um, so I, I think to come back to this board and, and be able to, you know, show a, a complete understanding of what you can ver versus what you cannot do and make sure that you're not doing what you cannot do um, is, um, I think that's imperative. Sorry, Maria, I was on mute. Uh, any further comment from board members? I think that's sufficient for um, this factor, and it might go into the third factor as well. Okay. So the go third ahead, factor proceed. is the relationship. Okay, thank you. The, the relationship between the nature of the crime and the purposes of regulating the occupation, profession, business, or trade for which the license, certificate, or registration is sought. Um, and just for reference for board members, um, you all know this, but statutorily, the purpose of regulating the profession is to promote the reliability of information that is used for guidance in financial transactions or for accounting for or assessing the financial status or performance of commercial, non-commercial, and governmental enterprises. Okay, thank you, Maria. Uh, I think you know, one observation I would have, and it, it, it stems also from the, um, the memorandum dated October 9th that legal counsel provided is that, um, when we look at the relevant statutes about the board's authority to grant or deny reinstatement of a license here, um, it talks about licenses uh, in the certificate of certified public accountant shall be granted to persons of good moral character who meet the education, experience, and examination requirements of the subsections and who make application for the certificate. And then it, it defines good moral character as the lack of a history of dishonest or felonious acts. And in this case, we have a history of dishonest and felonious acts, and therefore, I think it is relevant to that factor. Um, any further board member uh, comments? Yes, I, I would add to that, that, that in regulating the profession, which is what we are charged with doing, uh, one of our responsibilities is to make sure that those persons that we allow licenses to have, to, to have licenses or to use licenses, you know, honesty, integrity, uh, fitness to perform the duties of an accountant are all very important. And I think in this case um, are lacking. Thank you, Larry. Any further board member comment? Mr. Chairman, um, 
First of all, Maria, thank you very much for the analysis. It's very helpful. But um, on page three of your memo, um, section three, little I, which I think is the issue that we're on right now, uh, the last sentence, um, your conclusion, therefore, there is a relationship between the nature of the crime and the purposes of regulating the occupation of certified public accountants. And I, I agree with that, and I think that's well stated. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, friends. Any further comment? Mr. Sood? Yes. Uh, Mr. Sid, we show you as being muted. There you go. Okay. Is there any other questions you have that I can answer them right now? One of my take is that you are telling me the word accounting in any way and fashion is a wrong use because I thought there are, there are a lot of people who are accounting people and you know, but they may not be CPAs. But, but anyway, I will take that out. Uh, out of my websites and all that. Uh, second, uh, I think that that's what I'm saying. You know, uh, I will comply with that right away because I did not know that you cannot use the word accountant. So basically, I'll start using the word bookkeeping or something like that. Uh, also, my other thing is, uh, you know, like uh, I prepare taxes. You know, so. That shouldn't be a problem because I have a PTN number. You don't have to be a CPA to prepare tax uh, Is there any uh, other questions you have? I don't see that the board members have any further questions for you, Mr. Sood. And um, you know this uh, meeting will be publicly available so that you and or your uh, attorneys or those who are assisting you can see exactly what the concerns were. And specifically, they were using some form of the word accountant accounting in your business name um, you can provide accounting services the prohibition is against using the word accountant or accounting in your business name um, and that's a key takeaway for you and i'm glad that that, that you're going to comply with that mr sue so appreciate that uh, at this point i don't think that there are any other board member questions for you uh, at this time Maria, will you go ahead and uh, proceed with the next factors? Yes, thank you, Kevin. The fourth factor is the relationship between the crime and the ability, capacity, and fitness required to perform the duties and discharge the responsibilities of the occupation, profession, business, or trade. Okay, thank you, Maria. Um, you know, again, in this particular case, the crime relates to basically concealment and, and falsehood with respect to assets in a bankruptcy proceeding, which I think is directly relevant to this factor. Um, are there any other board member comments with respect to that? I think um, this might be a paraphrase, but um, I agree that um, the conviction does bear on fitness with respect to the responsibilities of this profession. Thank you, Todd. All right, Kevin, I'll be ready to do the fifth factor if that is okay. Okay, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, any evidence of rehabilitation or treatment undertaken by the individual that might mitigate against the relationship of crime to the occupation, profession, business, or trade? So, um, as I heard on record, the board had concern about the absence of rehabilitation. So at this time, that those um, concerns can be voiced. Thank you, Maria. And I think Todd uh, directly related raised that issue in his questions uh, yeah. earlier. Uh, and and um, you know, there, there, at least as I heard it, there was not a really robust response to that that would create mitigating factors. You know, to say that. Uh, um, 
fresh start should be warranted here. One, one other uh, comment from me. Um, I think that, um, you know, some maybe the state ethics course that we have, I, I know that Mr. Sood completed, I think, something back in 2005. Um, but the current state ethics course, I think you would learn about the use of senior accountant, accountant accountancy, counting, um, all of that. And um, to me, that would would probably go a long way in helping him understand the rules of our state uh, for his profession. Thank you, Judy. Any further comments? Todd? I would uh, agree with the, the reference to the prior test question and testimony and agree that it would be helpful for the board to um, to see, you know, while while we understand and um, with your uh, position that you know you've essentially uh, you know served the time here, uh, we would like that is uh, that is accurate. But we would have it would have been helpful uh, in this decision and determination to see other evidence of professional development or um, rehabilitation that. Uh, Mitigated some of the concern and direct uh, relation of of the fence to to this profession. So I, I think I think that would be helpful. Is material here, but would be helpful in the future. Thank you, Todd. Any other comments on this factor? Hey, Maria, I think we're ready for the sixth factor. Thank you, Kevin. This is our final factor, um, and it's not generally applicable to this pro professional license, um, but we do have to state it for the record. So any applicable federal laws regarding an individual's participation in the occupation, profession, business, or trade. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I agree with your view, Marie. I'm not sure that that's really ter terribly applicable here. Uh, we don't have an SEC violation or something of that nature. Um, you know, I guess you could argue that the bankruptcy um, laws, uh, you know, or surrounding concealment of assets may have been violated, but, but apart from the original uh, matter, I don't know of any additional other federal laws that would be applicable here. Thank you, Kevin, that's sufficient. Um, so now that we've discussed all six of those factors, um, I need a motion to adopt the factors that were discussed as well as the reasoning um, and a vote. Okay, uh, is, is there such a motion? So moved. Thank you, Todd. Do we have a second? Second. Second. We have a second. Is there any further discussion uh, on the motion relative to the six factors in the discussion that's already taken place? I have a question. Will this be reduced to writing per that statute? Yes, it will, and Mr. Seed will be notified um, in writing of his denial. Thank you. A any further questions or comments? Okay, uh, Karen, will you call the roll call on that motion? Yes, sir. Andy Bonner. Aye. Janet Booker Davis. Aye. Cam Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Gary Elmore. Aye. Greg Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. Kevin Monroe. Aye. Hey Moon. Aye. Todd Skelton. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. The uh, motion passes. Uh, Maria, are there any other uh, formal actions that the board needs to take at this time in this matter? Yes, thank you, Kevin. There's one final um, justification statement that I have to read per the statute. And at that time, after I complete that um, reading, I will need a motion to adopt the justification statement. And then that will conclude our um, analysis of this. So bear with me. Okay. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Kevin. 
The Tennessee State Board of Accountancy on October 20th, 2020 decided to deny your request for reinstatement as a result of your conviction of concealment of assets on or about October 13th, 2005. The Tennessee State Board of Accountancy has decided to take this action after considering the aforementioned factors as set forth by the Fresh Start Act. If you wish to contest this determination, you may file a petition within 30 business days of the receipt of this notice in Davidson County Chancery Court, at which time the board must demonstrate by the preponderance of the evidence that the individual applicant, licensee, certificate holder, or registrant Registrant's conviction is related to the applicable occupation, profession, business, or trade. And I will need a motion that the justification statement is adopted. Okay, thank you, Maria. Is there a such a motion? Motion. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a second. Thank you, Larry. Is there any further discussion or comment? Karen, will you go ahead and call the roll on that motion? Andy Bonner. Aye. Janet Booker Davis. Aye. Emily Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Larry Elmore. Aye. Greg Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. Evan Monroe. Aye. Amy Moon. Aye. Todd Skelton. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. Thank you, Karen. Uh, the motion passes. Uh, and I think, Maria, can you confirm that this concludes the activities or actions that are necessary on the part of the board with respect to this reinstatement for now? It does, Kevin. And I just want to thank you all for your patience and cooperation in this matter. Also, would like to extend thanks to Mr. Sood for participating in the meeting today. I know that it was not easy. Um, well, thank, thank you very much. For your time and i'm glad i came by uh, just wanted to get myself rehabilitated but i guess that's fine whatever i go with your decision that's what i say. i appreciate that mr sood and and uh we wish you the very best of luck going forward as this process of your rehabilitation continues um uh, Wendy, I show that it's about 1030 or just a little bit thereafter. I would suggest that we take a 15 minute break and reconvene at 1045 central time. Um, and uh, if you go on break, would just suggest that you both mute your microphone and uh, stop your video until we resume. So we'll resume at 1045 central time. Sounds good. Thanks. Teleconferencing and, and the nominating committee's procedures for selecting their slate. Uh, and um, those are going to be voted on at the annual meeting. Uh, I actually got an email uh, as a Tennessee board member uh, detailing those out with, in advance. They wanted to make sure everybody got a copy of them in advance. And so if you're going to the annual meeting, be sure to read that so that, uh, that you can understand what changes are being made there. Uh, we um, we heard about the agenda for the NASPA's uh, first virtual annual meeting uh, on November 2nd through the 4th. Um, and as we talked about yesterday, there's a lot of changes coming down. Um, and, you know, in this right here with, with what's going to take place, we had voted back in July of 24th board meeting to, uh, to unanimously support the advancement for CPA evolution in the effort to design and implement a need um, uh, to approach to or to change a, a new approach to the uh, CPA license. And so there's so many things that are affected by that statement uh, that uh, this is really going to be an, uh, uh, an eventful uh, annual meeting and a lot of information uh, can be learned. And, and we also have a breakout session that allows uh, each one of the uh, boards together and then to ask questions and, and can and offer concerns related to anything that they've heard at the annual meeting. Uh, so I, I again encourage you to sign up and go to that. Uh, M. Bishop had sent out a notice which you got yesterday that uh, was encouraging 100% attendance from all boards. And so it would be great to have the Tennessee board being 100% attendance. Um, Kim Bishop kind of updated us on what was going on uh, with NASPA related to COVID issues and, and service issues. And so uh, as a board member, um, for NASPA, if you have any concerns there, if you heard anything, please pick up the phone and call me uh, and let me know so I can 
I'll take that back to NASPA. Um, the, um, we, we actually held a, a new state board member orientation session, uh, and Greg Gilbert attended that. And of course that was talked about yesterday. Uh, and we, uh, we actually, uh, learned, you know, that the uniform accountancy act committee, um, proposed education model rule changes on May the 26th. Uh, they were actually opened up for comment and that comment period closed on August 31st, 2020. Uh, the UAA committee met on 9-16, uh, September the 16th to review the comments received. Uh, they got uh, responses from 16 accountancy boards, uh, seven societies, 11 educators, and six individuals. Uh, at that meeting, uh, they went, they thoroughly reviewed all the comments and the committee recommended that NASP and the UA model rules be amended accordingly. Uh, we had a special call meeting on October the 13th for the board. Uh, and at that meeting, we went through uh, those changes. Uh, um, we went, um, we talked about what comments were and then we had we had a vote and unanimously approved the changes that were proposed. And so those will be presented at the annual meeting. So I encourage you just from that point to, to, to learn because uh, uh, Coulter Baker will, will give us, uh, the chairman will give us an accounting of that and, and tell us what all uh, is took place. And also, uh, we were also informed at that meeting that the, uh, uh, the 2021 committees had been assigned. Uh, we actually started getting emails last week. Uh, and so appointments have been uh, made. And if you have been appointed to a committee, you probably have already gotten an email associated with that uh, from our vice chair, uh, Carlos Barrera. So uh, that's all I really have to, to, uh, to report on the NASPA board. Any questions? All right, I'll send it back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Andy. And also, uh, uh, just to uh, put a give a pat on the back to Andy, he also convened a very um, well organized uh, Southeast regional call uh, amongst the state boards in the Southeast region, the board chair people, and the executive directors that uh, also had good topical coverage. And uh, Andy, you just did a great job of orchestrating that, that meeting. Thank you. That's very kind. Uh, next item are NASBA committee updates, and uh, these committee assignments may now no longer be current, but I know that we have several of our board members who have been actively working on committees. Um, we've got the audit committee, and I think that involved Judy and uh, Larry, and uh, Judy or Larry, do either of y'all have any comments or updates about your uh, committee work? I will let Larry um, give the summary. Um, this is his, this will be his last audit committee summary because he's moving on to bigger and better things and he can tell you. Okay, fair enough, Judy. Thanks, Judy. Uh, yeah, we had a really good uh, audit committee meeting, uh, what, two or three weeks ago, Judy, I guess. This this committee meets in several stages as far as the, the adoption or the approval of the audit report from LBMC. <clears throat> we get sent out the uh, financials to peruse and critique, and then and then we get the uh, MDNA, and then we finally come together virtually this time in a meeting to uh, to, to quote meet with the auditors and with management, and it went really well. Um, as usual, there was a lot of robust discussion, as that's the big term these days. Um, and the audit was approved, and uh, and actually the appointment of LBMC as auditors for another year was also approved. Uh, and as Judy said, um, this was my third year on that committee, so I'll be rolling off. I'm actually moving to the Uniform Accountancy Act committee, um, and will be involved in that committee for um, at least one year. So. Um, but Judy, Judy, as usual, did a great job in participating in the discussion, and uh, she'll 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 uh, continue the banner for the Tennessee board on that committee and, and do a great job, I'm sure. All right, thank you, Larry. Um, 
Uh, Pam, you've been working on the computer-based training committee uh, and work group. Is there any uh, update on, on those activities? Yes, that's been a, um, a very relevant group because we deal with anything surrounding administration of the exam. So when COVID hit, of course, um, that was a key topic of conversation and we pretty much dealt with that at the last board meeting when we discussed um, everything that was decided there. But as an outgrowth of that uh, issue, um, the committee has been discussing the broader point of remote testing. And um, it's not just remote testing. Well, most pressingly, it's remote testing if we have a disruption similar to COVID, but it's also um, remote testing on a permanent basis. And uh, whether that would be, you know, whether things would just shift to that. And the AICPA is seriously considering that, and uh, you've you've read all that. So key issues, um, Colleen from NASBA has said the key issues that she keeps hearing about are security, security for the individual testers, and security of the uh, database and the set of questions, et cetera. Um, and of course, you have to deal with these in the United States and also internationally. So it's it's a major consideration, and I encourage you to to go through the resources that we've been provided about that. And then also, um, it's not a committee; it's a transition a task force that I'm on, um, considering the transition from the current format of the CPA exam to uh, the CPA evolution format. And there's not, you know, a carryover between the four parts we have now and the four parts that will be in place then. Specifically, as you know, there will be three required common parts and then a fourth one where you choose from three areas. And the question is, what if people have passed parts under the old model? Under what circumstances can they carry those over to the new model? And, um, you know, there's a consideration of wanting to include you know, as many people who are qualified to be CPAs as would be prudent because our profession has suffered some downturn in the number of people uh, taking the CPA exam. But then on the other hand, you want to make sure they are qualified under the standards the profession has at that point. So there's nothing to be said about that at this point. We've been asked not to discuss um, things that we've uh, been dealing with, but that's an ongoing process. And of course, that won't be until 2024, but the transition might start before. Thank you, Pam. Um, any questions for, for Pam on, on her uh, report out? I think you've got a, 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 a committee uh, Work group assignment, Pam, that a lot of people have some interest in uh, both now and in the future. So thank you for continuing on in that effort. Um, I think, uh, I know, Janet, you have been appointed as the Southeast Regional Representative to the nominating committee of NASPA. I don't know if they've met in the interim, but uh, any, any update or report out on that activity, Janet? Uh, we have not met uh, so far, so I don't have anything to report on that one. And then the other uh, group that I'm on is the CPA Examination Review Board. I think this is my last year on that board. And uh, we issued a report at the regional meetings for 2019. And... Uh, reported that state boards can continue to rely on the CPA exam policies and procedures. And right now we're starting our planning for the 2020 review and gonna be meeting in uh, November uh, to approve that planning for this year coming up. So, <clears throat> that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Janet. Um, other uh, committee reports that I may have missed. I think I've captured everybody. 
All right, we will go ahead and proceed to our standing board committee reports. And uh, the uh, first one uh, we'll turn to Gay Moon with respect to the uh, licensing committee. There are several action items uh, for the board's full consideration that were discussed yesterday in uh, a fair amount of detail by the licensing committee. And so Gay, I'll turn it over to you for, for your report. Thank you. Um, I'll keep the comments pretty pretty quick because we did have very thorough discussions on each of these. Uh, we have four credit extension requests that were made by candidates. The first one is Carter Chandler. His BEC expired March 31st. He has requested that we extend this to 12-31-2020 um, because of COVID and an, a serious illness and quarantine issues. The committee voted to approve his extension request. And so that is our recommendation to the full board. Thank you, Gay. Um, are, are, are you getting that in the form of a motion? Yes. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? I'll segment. Thank you, Andy. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Not Karen, will you call the roll on that motion? Andy Bonner. Aye. Janet Booker Davis. Aye. Pamela Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Harry Elmore. Aye. Greg Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. Kevin Monroe. Aye. A. Moon. Aye. Todd Skelton. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. Okay, thank you. That motion passes. Okay, the second item is Ms. Elizabeth Harper. Her CPA sections expired as early as September of 16, and the latest were September of 19. Um, we could not find any real support for applying an extension to her, her credits because of so much time that has elapsed. And so the committee voted to recommend to the full board that we deny her extension request. And I make that as a motion. Okay, thank you, Gay. Is there a second to that motion to deny the extension request? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion um, with respect to that reinstatement request? I should point out I'm recusing myself in this situation. Okay, thank you, Pam. We'll make sure that that gets noted. Um, can I'm, I'm going to rec recuse myself also, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so both uh, Pam and Andy are going to recuse from this um, particular reinstatement vote. Um, before we call that vote, just noting that in this case, the motion is to deny um, the extension request. I said reinstatement, but this is the extension request for uh, candidate um, um, uh, Harper. Um, any further comment or discussion? Okay, uh, Karen, will you call the roll? And again, an affirmative vote. If you vote aye, you're voting to deny the extension request. Annette Booker Davis. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Harry Elmore. Aye. Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. Sun Monroe. Aye. A. Moon. Aye. Todd Skelton. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. Thank Mr. You, Monroe, I have marked that Mr. Bonner and Dr. Church were recused. Okay, thank you. Um, the motion to deny uh, extension uh, for candidate Harper has passed. So okay, we'll go on to the next uh, item. The third item is Ms. Mary Claiborne Sharp. Um, regs expires 12-31-20. She said as a result of Ms. Prometric Centers being closed, she wanted an extra 49 days. 
actually she only lost 30 days because of the window blocked out. Um, we didn't really feel like she has plenty of time. She had not necessarily uh, scheduled other parts. So the committee voted to deny her extension request. And I make that as a motion. Thank you, Jay. Is there a second to that motion? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further comment or discussion on this extension request? And again, the, the motion here is to deny uh, credit extension. So if you vote yes, you are voting to deny credit extension. Karen, will you go ahead and call the roll? Andy Bonner. Aye. Booker Davis. Aye. Pamela Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Elmore. Aye. Greg Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. Kevin Monroe. Aye. A. Moon. Aye. Todd Skelton. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. Thank you, Karen. Uh, that motion to deny a credit extension request for candidate Sharp has passed. Um, Dan, I'll turn it back to you. The um, final credit extension request was Ms. Angela Wang. She is a China um, resident and citizen. Last quarter, we did extend a young man who, because of travel restrictions between the U.S. and China, we allowed him an additional extension through 1231-21. And this is the same circumstance. We don't know when travel restrictions will be uh, removed. So the committee voted to grant an extension of time until 1231-2021 for Ms. Wang. And I put that before the board as a motion. Thank you, Gay. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Judy. Thank you. Is there any further comment or discussion? Karen, will you call the roll on the motion to grant the extension request for candidate Wang through December 31 of 2021? Yes, sir. Andy Bonner. Aye. And at Booker Davis. Hi. Pamela Church. Aye. Aye. Larry Elmore. Aye. Greg Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Aye. Kevin Monroe. Aye. Lee Moon. Aye. Todd Skelton. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. Karen, did you skip me? I didn't hear my name. It's Stephen. Sorry. I'm so sorry about that. Um, Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Thank you. My apologies. Don't shortchange me on my vote. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Karen. The motion to grant candidate Wang's extension request is approved. Uh, any, any other business uh, from the yes. slide? We've got two more items. Wendy gave us all an update on the Tennessee State Specific Ethics course, and annually the board has to approve the course outline. Uh, the committee looked at the course outline with just a few changes, um, suggestions on cases that might be covered in the course. And we recommend to the full board that we approve the course outline as presented to us yesterday. And I present that as a motion. Thank you, Gay. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion uh, or comment with respect to the proposed outline for the 2021 Tennessee State Specific Ethics course? Hearing none, um, Karen, will you please call the roll on that motion? Andy Bonner. Aye. Janet Booker Davis. Aye. Pamela Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Larry Elmore. Aye. 
Greg Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. Kevin Monroe. Aye. Gay Moon. Aye. Todd Skelton. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. Hey, thank you. That motion passed. And uh, Gay, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, the final item was NASPA requested that we consider a BEC review course, which is part of the college curriculum um, as an upper division accounting course. After reviewing um, and having some discussion, the committee voted to recommend to the board that we accept the BEC review course within a college um, circumstances as upper division accounting. And I put that before the board as a motion. Thank you, Gabby. Is there a second? Second. A second by Judy. Thank you. Any further comment or discussion uh, on this one? I have, I have one question based on what something Gay just said. Did you say that NASBA asked us to, to do this or asked us to consider this? To consider do it. Uh, second, second. I'll, I'll take this one. Um, <clears throat> if you. Um, so NASPA didn't particularly ask us. I was asking you because we have a candidate that uh, was three hours short and it was questioned by Lipscomb, uh, did not realize that the board did not accept BEC exam review courses. And this has come up once or twice before and I just thought it was good to revisit and I had no history to document why this decision had been made in the past. So. Uh, that's why we're here on this item. My apologies about NASBA asking. I guess it was a result of the education courses. Any other uh, questions or discussion? Karen, will you please call the roll on that motion? Andy Bonner. Aye. Janet Booker Davis. Aye. Pamela Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge? No. Larry Elmore? Aye. Greg Gilbert? Aye. John Griesbeck? Aye. Kevin Monroe? Aye. A. Moon? Aye. Todd Skelton? Aye. Judy Weatherby? Aye. Hey, thank you, Karen. Uh, that motion does pass. Uh, any other uh, items uh, from the law? That concludes our, our conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Gay, and also thank the uh, licensing committee. Uh, the next committee, standing committee report, is the enforcement committee, and I'll turn that one over to Andy Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yesterday, the report. The committee met and went through uh, uh, the agenda. Uh, we have uh, three different levels that we're going to present today. The first will be the uh, consent agenda. Uh, we have eight cases there. Uh, we have three uh, proposed disciplines, and then we have uh, four re representations uh, that we're going to present to and ask for a vote. Uh, we'll start with the consent agenda. Uh, and what we'd like to do is take each section uh, on its own and have a vote for each one of those three different areas. Um, the um, um, case number one deals with acts discreditable, uh, professional competency, contingency fee violations, and independence violations. Uh, the board received a referral from a licensee involving a former employee. The firm alleges that the respondent provided or attempted to provide services that were not known to the firm's partners or authorized by the partner group. Concerned that some of the services uh, might be a breach of professional and ethical standards, the respondent denied all allegations, stating that she was fully transparent with the partners of the firm and that the activities performed uh, for clients. Uh, the matter was referred to the investigator for review. The matter was also discussed in more detail with the complainant and evidence was collected from the firm. Um, there is no evidence that the respondent uh, um, ever billed clients for services on a contingency basis. Uh, there's no evidence the respondent performed any services for clients outside her level of expertise. 
Uh, there's uh, no evidence that the respondent attempted to conceal her activities from the firm's partners or benefited financially on a personal level for her actions. Uh, accordingly, her actions do not rise to the level of acts of discreditable or, or represent any violation of board law or rules. So the recommendation here is to close. Uh, our second case to, uh, today is dishonesty and the act of uh, discreditability. Um, you know, this, um, the second case also goes along with uh, case number seven and case number eight. And specifically here is uh, on cases two and seven is anonymous tips. Um, if, if we don't have any evidence uh, when, when anonymously people are reporting this, it's kind of hard uh, to go out and, and to dig in and find that evidence basis on the accusation. Uh, actual items of subsequent details uh, are very helpful in these situations. So we encourage that if it's anonymously being presented. Uh, also, um, when, uh, you know, if there's no details in the cases, it, it makes it harder uh, to go out and look at, and, but we do go out and review and investigate. Um, on case number two, the board received an anonymous complaint against the respondent alleging unethical activity by the firm. The complaint alleges many issues that are internal firm fact matters not governed by board law or rules. Allegations under the board's purview were included accusations that the firm inappropriately withdrew money from client accounts, resulting in multiple lawsuits against the firm. A respondent denied all allegations with the exception of one, and that allegation involved a relationship between two consulting adults and no violations or any discrimination or harassment laws occurred. The complaint was forwarded to the investigator for review in regard to allegations of dishonor or fraudulent activity by the firm. There is insufficient evidence to support the allegations in this case with recommendation to close. Uh, case number three. May I interrupt here? Can, or is, the, uh, is the board interested in a motion to approve all cases on the consent? Agenda. Just in the interest, of, I think you do a great job <laughs> summarizing. But since we, I think we're all present yesterday, I'm I'm yeah. happy to make the motion. Okay, so uh, uh, we do have a motion from Todd to go ahead and approve the cases that are in the consent agenda. Um, is there a second to that motion? Then we'll open up for discussion. I'll second that motion. We have a, a motion and a second. Uh, this would be to approve uh, cases, I believe, one through um, eight in the consent port portion of the agenda of the legal report. Is there any further comment, question, or discussion on any of those uh, cases? Uh, Mr. Chairman, there were some edits made just to the context of number eight. Um, I'm not sure if the board would like to note that. Yeah, that might be good to summarize, Wendy, since we did make a change there based on the discussions uh, and the committee did approve that change yesterday. But to, just to highlight um, the notion on that, um, uh, maybe if you could just review what those changes were. Okay, I sure will, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the respondent provided a sworn statement. He affirmed that he did not provide accounting and bookkeeping services to the real estate clients. Um, this was a uh, holding out as a license or um, dishonest in objectivity. Um, and what we did have was, nor did he create any fake check stubs as the complaint claims. Uh, we also added respondent has been engaged in the practice of tax work for over 15 years and could not assert whether he provided tax services to individuals who he also provided real estate services to. Respondent did not recall providing both tax and real estate service concurrently to any of those clients. Okay. And that's what was thank added you, yesterday. Yeah, and thank you, Wendy, for emphasizing the additions that were made to that one case on the consent agenda. Um, items. Any further questions or comments on any of the consent uh, item cases one through eight? So we have a motion to approve the committee recommendations on each of those uh, uh, cases one through eight in the consent agenda. Karen, will you please call the roll on that motion? Andy Bonner. Aye. Booker Davis. Aye. 
Adam Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Larry Elmore. Aye. Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. Evan Monroe. Aye. A. Moon. Aye. Skelton. Aye. Eddie Weatherby. Aye. Okay, thank you. That motion passes and the uh, Committee recommendations uh, stand approved by the entire board for the consent agenda item cases. And you want to take us through the proposed discipline uh, case? Yeah, I'll just combine all three of the proposed discipline cases and just say that uh, all three relate to referrals from other boards within the state of Tennessee. Um, the um, In those cases, uh, uh, non-licensed CPAs uh, or CPA firms and or uh, CPAs with um, a um, not having a peer review um, actually um, engaged in a test work. And so um, our recommendation is, is on number nine that we uh, authorize a formal hearing with the authority to settle via consent order upon the respondent's completion of two hours of ethics courses and payment of civil penalty in the amount of $750. Uh, on case number 10, that we authorize a formal hearing with the authority to settle via consent order upon the respondent's payment of civil penalty in the amount of $1,000. Um, and um, the difference in the fines there was that the, um, the first one was uh, very outcoming, uh, worked with us and um, the next two uh, the next two did not. And so, uh, the, uh, and in case number 11, the authorized a formal hearing with the authority to settle the consent order upon the uh, respondent's payment of civil penalty in the amount of $1,000 and uh, include a letter of instruction to respondent explaining that compilation report is a test work and the test work can only be performed by licensees. Okay. Thank you, Andy. So are you putting in the form of a motion for the board to approve the committee recommendations in each of those uh, uh, three cases? Yes, I propose that uh, cases nine through uh, 11 that, that the recommendations is reported uh, in the committee meeting and reported today. Okay, thank you, Andy. So we have a motion. Uh, is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on any of those three cases, uh, numbers nine through 11? in the legal report. Karen, will you please call the roll on the active motion? Andy Bonner. Aye. Annette Booker Davis. Aye. Pamela Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Larry Elmore. Aye. Fred Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. Evan Monroe. Aye. A. Moon. Aye. Todd Skelton. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. Can we get to my unmute button? Thank you, Judy. Uh, the motion passes to approve the committee recommendations for each of those three cases in the proposed discipline category. And then the last category is the representation. So, Andy, I'll turn it back over to you for that. Okay. Um, um Re-representations, case number 12, uh, uh, the respondent is deceased. And so the recommendation is that um, that we close the case. The respondent died in September of 2019. Um, case number 13 is a uh, physical dishonesty. Um, we have gotten a, a, um, just some, uh, an update that the new information is, is that Trey Watkins met uh, in an informal conference uh, with legal and a board member being himself. And uh, this was held on January 27, 2020, um, where the respondent admitted that his actions should not have occurred. However, his, his actions did result in a criminal conviction, which has now been expunged from his record. Um, based on the informal conference discussion, respondent has reportedly offered a counteroffer. Uh, yesterday in committee, uh, uh, the committee members um, did not agree with that accounting, that respondent's offer, 
And so the, uh, the, the new recommendation via committee is that, that suspend respondent's license through December 31st, 2021, in order to require respondent to appear before the board, um, be before the board if restatement is pursued, uh, require respondent to pay a $2,000 civil penalty, and require respondent uh, complete a, a three-part NASBA ethics course prior to December 31st, 2021. Um, case number 14, um is a uh also involved um pending litigation um, that uh litigation um uh, was has been uh, agreed upon and, and never went to trial um and so uh, legal reached out to the complainant and her attorney requesting a, a court ruling um on the allegations that the motion was heard and, and, and the judge had uh, held the decision in trial, the, the parties reached an agreement for trial, so there was never a ruling on the, from the court as to whether the experts should be disqualified based on conflict of interest or release of confidentiality information without waiver or, or authorization. Um, the committee came up and recommended that that case now be closed based on that new evidence. Um, um, the also uh, case number 15. Um, it dealt with a uh, firm being dropped in peer review uh, in um, 2015 or 2012. They went through peer review and then they did not. Um, they dropped the peer review process in 2015. There's, uh, there's no evidence that any um, um, audits were issued after 2015. The new information is due to uh, the lack of communication for respondent in this case was set for a formal hearing on October 20th, uh, which is today. Uh, the respondent has since been in communication with the board's attorneys and provided evidence of extenuating medical circumstances. Um, the respondent's license expired on 12-31-18 and respondent sold the firm in 12-2017 and currently is not the practice of accounting and is taking care of her mother. Uh, the committee's recommendation is due to the extenuating medical circumstances. It is recommended that the respondent agree to a consent order without civil penalty, flag respondent's license and require her to appear before the board in the event that she pursues license restatement. And with that, we cover the other four representations and I make that as a motion uh, for uh, from the uh, enforcement committee. Okay, thank you, Andy. So we have a motion to accept the new committee recommendations on each of the representation cases in the legal report. Um, and I think those uh, constitute cases 12 through 15. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second, thank you. Uh, any further question or comment or discussion on any of these representation cases? If not, Karen, will you please call the roll? Andy Bonner. Aye. Janet Booker Davis. Aye. Pamela Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Larry Elmore. Aye. Greg Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. Kevin Monroe. Aye. Amy. Aye. Todd Skelton. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. Okay, thank you, Karen. The, the motion to accept the new committee recommendations uh, passes. Uh, Andy, any further items from the enforcement committee? No further items from the enforcement committee, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, the one thing I'll note, because it's not there in the enforcement committee uh, legal report, uh, and that's a good thing, is that uh, as a result of the CP audits this year, I just wanna highlight what Wendy mentioned yesterday. We actually had no non-responses out of the more than 500 CPAs who were selected for CPE audit. Every one of them responded. And typically we would have, I think Wendy, you mentioned yet yesterday, 10 or so cases a year just relating to non-responding CPAs with respect to their CPE audits. And so that's 10 cases, disciplinary cases we didn't need to deal with. And uh, I just think that's, uh, fabulous if we can keep that string running. That's just uh, phenomenal. So thanks to 
Wendy and Wendy, you, you were kind enough to give thanks to the staff and uh, who were dogging this through and following up with each of the practitioners. So appreciate that very much. Uh, next standing committee report is laws and rules. And I'll turn that over to Chairman Larry Elmore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the uh, laws and rules committee uh, would like to make a recommendation to the full board about um, <clears throat> Three instances where um, uh, we would like to make a change to the rules related to uh, CPE requirements for renewals or reactivations. And those three instances are uh, number one, uh, a reactivation of a license, a number two, a, a, a reactivation of an expired license, um, the first one being inactive, second one being expired. And then the third case where you're renewing an initial certificate that has been in existence for less than two years, um, we'd like to add a requirement in each of those cases where <clears throat> the uh, renewal had to include um, two hours of board approved state specific ethics as a part of the um, required CPE. In the case of the, the short period license, we already have a requirement for 40 hours, uh, 20 of which being technical. We'd like to add two two hours to be included as part of that 40 of uh, ethics. And in the other two cases of um, inactive or expired licenses where they're being reactivated, uh, but to include as part of the 80, uh, two hours of state specific board approved ethics. So I would like to make that as a motion. Thank you, Larry. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Janet. So we have a motion and a second. Um, this was discussed uh, in committee yesterday, but are there any further <coughs> discussions or comments from the full board today? Hearing none, Karen, will you please call the roll on the motion? Andy Bonner. Aye. Annette Booker Davis. Aye. Emily Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Terry Elmore. Aye. Ed Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. Evan Monroe. Aye. Aye. A Moon. Aye. Lance Skelton. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. Okay, thank you. And that motion passes. And Larry, any further items for the uh, laws and the rules committee? Um, Kevin, this is Maria. I was just going to ask if we could also have a motion that gives me authority to set a rulemaking hearing for this. Um, the trend now for rulemaking is we're not able to do most rules as proposed. So I will need the board's um, permission to set a date for a rulemaking hearing. Motion to permit board council or the department set a uh, a hearing for this rule. Thank you. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hey, Karen, we call the rule on that motion, please. Andy Bonner. Aye. Annette Booker Davis. Aye. Pamela Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Harry Elmore. Aye. Greg Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. Evan Monroe. Aye. Hey Moon. Aye. Todd Skelton. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. Hey, thank you. That motion passes. And uh, Maria or Wendy, any further action needed from the board at this time on that matter? That is all I need. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, great. Um, the last standing committee reports relate to the executive committee um, and the discussion points in yesterday's committee meetings uh, related to a peer review update and um, several members uh, from the T Tennessee Society of CPAs were there to update us on peer review status and a number of related issues and, and their presence and con contributions to the discussions were greatly appreciated. We also had uh, discussion and review uh, under Wendy's direction 
for the fiscal year 20 year to date closing or near closing uh, results and the fiscal year 21 year to date uh, financial results. Although we're only a couple of three months into the fiscal year based on the reporting that we have. And uh, there was no action item resulting from those. Uh, also, uh, Wendy had uh, a report on uh, CP audit results and Wendy, any additional comments on that that you'd like to add at this point? Um, I, I guess just to reiterate a little bit ago, um, how smoothly the audit went this year, even with COVID um, and having everyone respond was really great. And also to point out that the non-compliance rate um, is really down to less than 3%, which um, speaks to requiring uh, that listing of CP at renewal. And I think we are um, doing a better job at protecting the public and ensuring compliance by doing that. So um, all around a, a good year. Thank you, Wendy. And I, I guess the only thing I would add is that that, that compares to a roughly 29% higher year non-compliance rate. So, uh, and additionally, that's going to mean that we will not be dealing with a lot of disciplinary cases that we would otherwise have dealt with from a CPE compliance. So the board's policy changes, um, I think were clearly effective. So hats off to those changes and hats off to the practitioners for for following through in an exemplary manner. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, there was one action item uh, from the executive committee report out, and that relates to the fiscal year 22 budget proposal. Uh, Wendy uh, overviewed uh, in, in detail, line item by line item, where our fiscal year 22 budget uh, was, uh, uh, was presented. And Wendy, any further comments or particular items that you'd like to highlight relative to that process? I think that um, I'll just brief, briefly indicate the proposed um, revenue and expenses as we laid out yesterday. So um, I am proposing our net revenues. This is our licensing revenue minus our reg fee to be at 935,000. Um, and then our general expenses at 689,638. And if you add year end cost backs that are allocated from the department, those would be 250,000, bringing our total expenditures at 939,638, uh, leaving us um, with a budget in the red of 4,638. Um, we do not include case and complaint revenue in that revenue number, so that uh, negative 4,000 should not be an issue um, if this budget's approved. Okay, thank you, Wendy. Um, uh, I would accept a motion to approve the budget for fiscal year 2022. I'll make a motion. Thank you, Andy. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on the uh, proposed budget for the year 22 that was reviewed in detail during the committee meeting yesterday and then highlighted again today by Wendy. Karen, will you please call the roll? Andy Bonner. Aye. Janet Booker Davis. Aye. Tom Church. Aye. Stephen Eldridge. Aye. Gary Elmore. Aye. Greg Gilbert. Aye. John Griesbeck. Aye. Kevin Monroe. Aye. Boone. Aye. Todd Skelton. Aye. Judy Weatherby. Aye. Thank you. That motion to approve the fiscal year 22 budget passes. Um, we are now down to the part of the agenda with respect to old and new business and um, traditionally we also note here that um, we've got representatives of the Tennessee Society uh, here uh, checking in for our board meeting. And I see Brad and Tara, that you've been listening in if you'd like. Are there any uh, comments um, or perspectives that you would like to add? Hearing none, we appreciate you being a part of the meeting and particularly also the robust uh, peer review update that we had yesterday. And we very much appreciate the close coordination 
and uh, cooperation um, that you extend to the state board. Uh, it, it helps all of our efforts. So thank you very much for that. Uh, is there any uh, other old or new business before the board? Hearing none, um, we will go ahead and adjourn. Hopefully we'll be able to meet in person in the, in the near future. But uh, whatever we do, we'll do our best to meet safely. So I appreciate everybody hanging in there both yesterday and today. That's a lot of Zoom or WebEx time. But thank you very much for the effort and the preparation that went into the meetings. And this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.